So the, <coughs> the title is indeed scaling in tensor networks in 1D and 2D. So I think this is the higher dimensional tensor network kind of um, a session. So I will include a little bit of 2D in my talk, but more generally the outline is the, is the following. Um, so I think we will mostly work um, with, with kind of um, infinite system matrix product states and also infinite system PEPs. So I, I'm quite a fan of these um, ideas which have been introduced um, by Guifre and, and collaborators um, over the years. And I think it's a very interesting paradigm to do many body uh, physics. And I'm also uh, passionate about understanding conformal field theories in ver various circumstances. And it actually turns out that um, MPS is particularly IMPS and also IPEPs are a good framework actually um, to, to investigate this challenging system, even though kind of um, at least in 1D they, they violate the area law mildly. So you might think this is a hard case, but I hope to show you that you can indeed get <coughs> very accurate results, at least for the Ising model, but also uh, still decently accurate results uh, beyond the Ising model as well. And so the <clears throat> there are three parts I would like to present you. They're not um, closely connected, so if, if I run over time, I can stop also a bit earlier. But I would like to start first with a, with a mo more recent work which just, we just put on the archive, um, where we were in intrigued, like hopefully many others, to understand what is the spectrum of the transfer matrix if you're in the finite entanglement scaling regime of IMPS. And we made an interesting observation, which turns out to be uh, quite... Um, a powerful practical value. So this is to, to extract the speed of light from um, IMPS <coughs> um, simulation. So that's one, one um, project. And then the other one is kind of work we're about to wrap up with, um, with Alex Eberharter. So that's um, <coughs> actually kind of trying to overcome some um, kind of challenges in the finite entanglement scaling, which, um, which have a good precision, but it seems to be difficult to systematically improve it. And so we were actually <coughs> um, playing by adding a relevant perturbation to the CFT, therefore gapping out the system and inducing a physically f finite correlation length. And then one can um, actually analyze MPS data with high accuracy as a function of this perturbation. And that turns out to be a, um, a quite an interesting handle also on critical systems in some, in some cases. And then in the end, I do justice to the higher dimensional part. And so that's work which is a bit older, but we, we have been uh, trying uh, to understand how one could generalize ideas which, which are called finite entanglement scaling in 1 plus 1D, but what is kind of a, a similar approach in a, for IPEP simulation, and so we, we and Philip Korba and Luca, Luca Taliacozzo worked in parallel on the same uh, problem, and so we came up with this finite correlation length scaling um, approach. Okay, so <clears throat> that's um, kind of the menu for, for today. Let's start with the first part. And so this is this extracting the speed of light uh, from, from IMPS. And so let's, um, le let's discuss what actually the, the, the first question was. Um, so here I, I present you the motivation from the point of view um, um, that like historically, I think if you look in the old literature on, on DMRG at, at the time um, and also analyzing critical systems, you see in the early days, say in the, in the 90s when MPS, DMRG at the time was, was around, uh, people were already then interested to measure central charge. But at the time it was not understood that the entanglement entropy was governed by the central charge. Um, primarily. And so people actually use the Casimir effect. You see that's a famous result from conformal field theory. It's that kind of the ground state energy. Um, it's, it's extensive and it has an offset, um, um, but then it's, there's also some correction to um, kind of which is governed by both the central charge and the, and the velocity. So you, you know that if you work in the Hamiltonian formulation of, of um, conformal field theory, then actually the space and time are, um, I mean, have the same power laws, but there's a prefactor which relates the two, the two directions. That's actually the speed of light or the speed of sound. And so, um, so in those early works, you actually needed to know both. Uh, kind of me measure ground state energies, but you also needed to have an estimate for the sound velocity or the speed of light to actually infer the central charge. So before using the, the entanglement entropy, you, you actually had to do both. And actually turned out it was really difficult to get the high precision on the, on the, the speed of sound. And also it, it relied on kind of knowledge of, of, of the conformal field theory in the first place to actually estimate what, what this, uh, the speed of sound was. 
Uh, then in recent years, th there has been some, some work by the Gent group, but also Lawrence and I guess Yuto and, and Frank and others, um, basically um, constructing excitations and then investigating the, the low momentum behavior of excitations. One can also infer uh, the speed of sound uh, to, to some, some extent. And, um, and so something I would like to show you now is that there was also an approach by Natalia Zepig and Fra uh, Frederick Mila, where they um, made an interesting observation about the spectrum of the, the, the local um, Hamiltonian in a DMRG. And, and that's actually a second motivation, I will come to that, is, um, is actually to, to understand what these spectra actually mean. So what Natalia and, and Frederick um, observed a few years ago is that um, I guess in, in this audience you're all familiar with this kind of diagram. So that's like the, the local effective Hamiltonian you have to, to solve in a, in a DMRG step. And here we're in a finite um, volume, finite system calculation. So we have an extended system. Uh, this is the MPO here in the middle of the Hamiltonian. And these are the tensors of, um, of the bra and the ket of your state. And so the effective Hamiltonian is this local object. You, you calculate its ground state given this environment. And then from this you derive the new the new um, kind of tensor for the next iteration. But something which is kind of interesting in that paper is that they actually looked at the, the spectrum of this local Hamiltonian. As I said, usually one just calculates the ground state, takes the eigenvector and, and goes on. But actually, the, it turns out that the spectrum of that object itself is interesting. And so what they observed is that as a, as a function of iteration, there is actually a meaningful spectrum if you, if you stop in the middle of a system, so like a symmetric si situation like this. Um, there's actually an interesting uh, spectrum here in the, in the middle, which is <coughs> kind of converged up to some level, depends on the bond dimension, but, but the lower part is actually qu quite nicely confirmed, uh, converged, sorry, and, um, and actually this, this local spectrum is actually uh, the spectrum of a boundary CFT. So, it, um, so it, it's kind of universal up to also a sound velocity, and then kind of these plots on the right from their paper show that the low energy spectrum, I mean, according to which boundary conditions there are and which theory there is a, there is a certain characteristic uh, structure of the energy spectrum with certain relative spacing. And they all collapse um, as 1 over L, as, as you expect from a CFT. Uh, and basically, knowing what the scaling dimensions of the fields are, because you know the CFT from the slope, you can actually then infer the speed of light uh, that way. And so like these are two, two interesting aspects. One is that the, this local um, DMRG spectrum for kind of 20, more than 20 years that has been overlooked that it actually has interesting structure. And second, it's actually useful to extract the speed of light with some precision. Yes? But Andreas, is it fair to say that that, is, that has nothing to do with the MRG? That's the spectrum of the Hamiltonian that you are putting on a finite system? Yeah, but I think there's a, there's a bit of emergence here in, in the sense that I think if you, they also in that paper, if the, the Hamiltonian is not critical, then actually the local spectrum here is not, is not like one-to-one -one the many-body spectrum of the extended system. Right. So, so, so there, is, there, is, there is something that you have to work kind of in a regime where you're in the finite size regime of a CFT, where you're kind of regulated by the IR cutoff of the finite system. You have fi like enough bond dimension so that the spectrum starts to see the entire system. And that, that's fine, but that's the point, that the, you have to work with bond dimension large enough that this spectrum that you're seeing through the MRG is yeah. actually the spectrum of the Hamil lattice Hamiltonian that you have. I'm just saying it's nice, you know, it's a tensor network conference, so we, we yeah. you know, tensor networks are cool, but, but this is a property of the Hamiltonian of the lattice that you are trying to, to understand. Yeah, but I think the part which I, I mean, I kind of agree. I mean, I think if you look at it in hindsight, it looks obvious. But still, I think there's the, the point that if you do that for a gapped system, you do the same thing. You, you're not recovering like the, the extensiveness. I think, I think the, because you're, the, the effective Hamiltonian is built in the environment of the, I, I of the way. So, so you would not use the MRG to see the Hamiltonian on the whole system yeah. in that case. All okay. I'm saying is that this, this spectrum that we're seeing here, you will find it if you look at the low energy excitations. You know, you could use exact diagonalization, yeah, yeah. right? And you would see that aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so it's nice that it appears in the MRG, but that's not the MRG property, right? It's the spectrum of the original Hamiltonian. It's, it, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's that. But it's kind of, um, I find it interesting that at least in some regime, yeah, uh, somehow the, the ground state, like the basis, the DMRG basis you're building up in your environment is then actually tailored to, to re, um, recover this on the entire system. I think this is kind of non-obvious or 
it's not obvious. I didn't, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and also I found this, pay, this, in, this um, kind of um, work interesting because um, um, at the time it was actually not known if you do the similar thing now for an, an infinite MPS, so where, where you're pretending to solve for an infinite system which is infinitely long, and then the only regulator is kind of the finite bond dimension, the question, what do you get there? Because you cannot get uh, the complete uh, continuous spectrum of a CFT on an infinite system. The spectrum would be dense, uh, continuous, and so you can't see anything. So it, there, there is something induced by the finite bond dimension. And so now what we, what we observed, which is kind of the, 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 what I think is a, is a cool result, is that so it, what we were motivated at, at least initially to understand uh, kind of the corresponding um, kind of a local effective Hamiltonian spectrum. So that's this. You see there's a contracted left and right boundary. Here there are two uh, kind of um, MPO uh, operators of your, of your Hamiltonian. So that's like one object. And then what we actually observed is an, another object which is famous, which is actually the transfer matrix across a, a unit cell of your IMPS setup. Um, the two spectra are actually identical. And what is kind of, uh, uh, kind of curious is that, uh, at least currently, I think all of us involved in this work, we don't understand the structure of what we observe. You see, so in the 1D case I just showed you for finite uh, system, there the, the, the structure of the energy spectrum you see is the finite volume CFT, so that's a definite prediction. That's what you observe. So here we have to admit that we don't understand why the levels are what they are, like what is the relative thing. But what is interesting is, this, nevertheless, is that the, the local Hamiltonian spectrum and the log of the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix are actually identical. And so how do you see that in this plot? Is that these are different models. So this is the Ising model, three state pots, and this is a spin one half Heisenberg chain uh, for some um, moderately large bond dimension. And so we, op we optimize for the ground state. And then we, we do this analysis of the local um, Hamiltonian spectrum of the transfer matrix spectrum, and one is the is, um, circles are the energy spectra, and the crosses are the kind of the, the spectrum of inverse correlation length. Um, and the only thing, so one thing is just like there's a common uh, uh, delta factor, but that's just for a global normalization um, for both of them. But then if you actually use the exact velocity, because all these three models have exactly known speed of light, then actually these two spectra, the crosses and the circles, ma match perfectly. And so I think that's an, an interesting observation. And, um, and then uh, actually based on some path integral um, kind of um, a picture, um, Lawrence and Frank uh, kind of um, um, came up with, with uh, at least in a kind of in the Euclidean uh, situation, uh, kind of th that the two objects, like the Hamiltonian spectrum, which is kind of the log of the temporal transfer matrix, and the kind of the transfer matrix spectrum, or the log of it in the spatial direction, should be the same. And so in the continuous time limit, there is also kind of some correspondence. That's also what uh, Luca and his collaborators uh, uh, saw in a different context a while ago. And so, so that's like one part of the story is that the, the two spectra, which kind of the structure of which we don't understand, but they are kind of identical up to a factor. And so then we, we thought, let's see whether we can turn that into a useful method to actually measure the, the speed of light. So we, we, we calculate for a given Hamiltonian the two spectra, and we find what is kind of the scale factor which matches them. And that's how we can extract the speed of light. And so we, now we show an application. So first we do some kind of re reference or some checking by doing the, the series of the Q state POTS model. So Q equals two is, is kind of a synonym for the Ising model. Then Q equals three and four are still um, have a CFT at their critical point. And so here you can see some ac actual numbers. And so for the Ising model, um, using these procedures of actually like kind of um, checking what is the scale factor which relates the the subleading eigenvalue of the transfer matrix with the subleading kind of the, the, the first gap in the local Hamiltonian spectrum, we can actually reproduce the, the velocity, the speed of light up to a, almost five, five digits. And it's also something like four digits or so for, for the, the three state POTS model and about um, three to four for the spin one half Heisenberg model. And that's actually quite accurate. I think there are no co comparable uh, results at, uh, using tensor networks. And there also was a recent work using some uh, kind of RG Monte Carlo type approach by Roberto Carr and his, his collaborator. And uh, I think these results here are way more, more accurate. And then as an application here in the spin business, um, what, what we did is now, now we can actually measure um, 
the, the speed of light or the spin wave velocity for uh, the half integer Heisenberg chain. So some of you might know that this, there is or was the Haldane conjecture that like um, um, integer spin chains have a gap, but half integer spin chains have no gap and they flow to a, um, a C equals one CFD in the infrared. Um, and so with, with kind of a bare spin wave theory, you have some understanding that the spin wave velocity should like linearly increase. Uh, that's fine, but there's also kind of a more refined prediction that actually once you subtract off this 2s, this proportional to s, there's actually like a, a remnant um, kind of um, a contribution to the speed of light, so some additional stiffening. And since we now have kind of quite accurate results for this um, speed of, of lights, we can actually check whether as, as we crank up s, and we go up to seven half, we can actually see that we, we are getting close to this expected value, which is supposed to become exact at large, at large s. So I think that's an interesting application of things which, which um, yeah, were never calculated. One was never able to calculate that to high precision. And I think that's, we made one step forward in that direction. Question about that. Um, so yeah. the method you use to get the speed of light here, is it just to demand that the spectra are equal in the previous slide? Is that Yes. How? Okay, so you just say that for them to be equal, there's a scaling, and that's how you, that's actually the method to explain. Exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks. So like, like, I mean, like if you, if you approach a new system, I think, um, I mean, here this is a plot, as you can see, there are like on the order of 10 or several tens of eigenstates in both uh, kind of spectra we calculate. I mean, this is just to convince ourselves that it's kind of conformal, the two spectra are the same. And once we're convinced of that, we can t basically take any pair of corresponding state and extract its velocity. It turns out that the lowest one is usually the most accurate. That's the one we kind of quote as the number. Yes? So you mentioned that you have some physical understanding of why you expect the two to be the same. Could you say a few more words about that? Uh, Lawrence, do you want to say something about that? No, but I mean, I mean, the, the idea here is is um, kind of okay. Perhaps it's, you can't see that, but but here, if you like tr trotterize the time evolution of. Um, of kind of a path integral representation, it's some imagined time evolution, that then in some limits you can convince yourself that the transfer matrix in space and the transfer matrix in time are the same up to um, kind of up to the scale factor. But one has to say, um, you, you see, you need some underlying picture that there's a CFT, that there is kind of Euclidean invariance or, or something like that in the first place. And then once you kind of uh, wrap that into a tensor network, that's what you observe. But again, as I insisted, at least with the uh, so some questions on the 1D case. I think this is, I mean, this is an in, in emergent quantity. I mean, already on the very naive level, you see that the, the object, which is the Hamiltonian spectrum, and, and the, the transfer matrix are not identical objects. They don't even have the same bond uh, kind of dimension. So at some point, these spectra will, will deviate from each other. They're not, this is not an identity on the MPS level. It's an emergent property. If you, your MPS is somehow optimized to, rep, to describe a CFT, then that what, that's what we get out. <coughs> Okay, um, and then we had another application where, um, where um, we look into kind of itinerant or at least partial itinerant system. So we looked into a Hubbard chain and a Hubbard ladder, uh, a two-leg ladder. And um, so the Hubbard chain, for example, is an attractive view. Hubbard chain, at that point, um, it has a spin gap, but there's a gapless ma uh, charge mode, which is there. And then we, we can measure the... Uh, that model is, is, is integrable, and then one can actually get, um, for example, the lot or uh, the speed of here. Sorry, here is the speed of light. We can get the speed of light from a, a comparison with the Betti ansatz case. But this is just to show that here for the Hubbard chain, it's a it's a system which has more degrees of freedom than just like the, the spin models we looked at. And so even there's a, a gap in the charge sector, uh, sorry, in the spin sector, then the charge sector still shows this emergent behavior, and we are we're quite close to the Betti ansatz result. And then the second problem is a bit more non-trivial. Um, it's a two-leg Hubbard ladder at finite doping. There it's also expected that this is a luther emery liquid, which means it has a spin gap, and there's a gapless uh, charge mode, which uh, should be responsible for a 1D analog of superconductivity. And so using uh, kind of this technology, it's now possible to extract the speed of light. So that's this, these curves here on this plot as a function of the filling. Um, one can, can get quite accurate results for the for the, the velocity. And then one can also 
using established technique, um, measure the compressibility. And for those of you who have, have some prior exposure to Luttinger liquid theory, if you know the velocity and the compressibility, you can actually infer the Luttinger liquid exponent. And then that's done in this inset here. And so you can study the, the Luttinger liquid exponent, which tells you whether the system is more prone to charge density wave fluctuations or to, to superconductivity. You can study that here in the density regime and also close to the, the, the MOT insulator um, at, at filling one, where there are some predictions, at least our data seem to converge. And there are also some two other data points from work by Dolphy and others. And there they did um, kind of fitting of correlation functions in real space. But uh, we believe that this is kind of less accurate than what we do because the, the correlation length uh, sorry, the real space fitting is much more impacted by finite bond dimension effects and so on than, than kind of this matching of the spectra which we do. Okay. <clears throat> so I think that would uh, conclude the speed of light part. Are there questions on this? Yes? Is it correct to say that the speed of light is, is you just look at the CFT, right? It has a column structure. Yes. You look at the stress tensor, um, which has scaling dimension 2 and spin 2. And that's, you, you would like to, to fix the speed of light such that this is a, yeah. a, a line. So, so you can do that on a circle as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So, so I think what you're saying is that you understood how to do that with the scaling of one dimension um, to the third power, which allows you to reach much more precision. But I mean, there were previous methods on the circle yeah. with periodic boundary. Periodic MPS, yeah, yeah. where so this, this could be you, done. You were part of those, I guess. But I don't remember. <laughs> no, I, I, all I'm saying is that, that what's really great is that you managed to simplify, uh, to, to, to just use one dimension to the third power methods, mm -hmm. which allow you to, uh, yeah. th that's, that's the essence. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm excited about results for two reasons. So I think one is what you just said. I think it's of practical value. It, it allows you in a cheaper way to get, in case you're interested by this quantity, it's non-universal, but say in a condensed matter, a, a, a kind of cold atomic gases, sometimes we are interested in those numbers just because they tell us like what temperature, what, yeah. uh, and so on. So I think it's interesting. And the other thing is also that at least I, because I'm, um, yeah, I, I was just kind of fascinated by this. No, I think there are two spectra, which at least currently we don't understand, but they're actually the same. And I, I mean, it's kind of my personal fascinations in doing numerics. Every now and then I stumble over kind of things which have to do with field theories and somehow you do kind of naively near algebra in some more or less complicated way. And suddenly you get the glimpse of, of uh, field theory structures or emergency kind of things which are the same, even though microscopic. This is fascinating. So I don't know. <laughs> yes? How is it to introduce next nearest neighbor interactions? Because if they're frustrating, you can really slow down the speed of light, or maybe yeah, is this something? But I mean, technically, worth? I mean, uh, kind of uh, as long as you have a Hamiltonian which you can describe with an MPO and frustration or further neighbor is not a problem, you can do that. No, there's no there's no assumption on the structure of the Hamiltonian. I mean, you have to write it as an MPO, but but you can do that with further neighbors. There's no no problem. <clears throat> Okay, there's another question. So, um, is there any reason that you uh, looked at this, this two body effective Hamiltonian? Because you should be able to get just the same results with um, the effective Hamiltonian of C based on this argument. On what? what what's on? Like just like the, the, like there's an effective Hamiltonian for the C, right? Which is a, a chi squared um, eigenvalue problem. So I, you, you mean, I mean, you, you, I mean, oh, you, you can take out one. You want, you want to take out both. You mean? I want to take out both. Yeah. Yeah. And you should be. Well, and we have not checked. Just, I think my student Alex, he did also think we just we just one instead of two. But I think with none, we have not tried. But but you're right. I mean, in the end, I mean, in, in the end, there's a lot already of information basically in the whole contracted MPO with the uh, with the boundary. I mean, with the yeah. But I I don't I have.
But this basically, this thing that we're just debugging, these small cases, yeah. still has the actual live MPO. Yeah, exactly. The, the whole MPO is actually contracted apart from the central um, stuff. I think even if you leave it out, it's... it's But, but I mean, the easiest we, we, can, we can check it in actual calculation. So perhaps I, we can discuss this late, later. OK. So, so just to say, like, based on your argument, it should be the same spectrum, right? So it cannot be that you can explain this, uh, the, the just eigenvalue problem for C, that you understand this spectrum completely, but not this spectrum, because they should be the same based on this argument. Yeah. Also, just but, but I'm also inclined to believe your suggestion. It might actually be that if we completely take this out, then, then it's, uh, it, should, it should actually... And it should even be, like, if, if you say, like, you, you were saying, like, the, the two spectra should be kind of the same, but it's clear that they cannot be the same because they're not even the same bond dimension. Yeah, yeah, then that's a way to circumvent that. Indeed. So yeah. maybe th this will work slightly better. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Huh? <coughs> See, I mean, from a pragmatic uh, point of view, it's just that, I mean, in, in uh, kind of in existing IMPS implementation, something like that actually pops up. So in that sense, like, the, the change is really minimal. I mean, okay, we can discuss how much of a of thing it is, but I, I, it's also something I, I just want to, I, mean, I forgot to mention. But this is kind of not a new algorithm in the sense that you have to, like, invest a lot of kind of a new algorithm to do that. You basically just have to, in, in one step, instead of just getting the ground state in your, when you do a DMRG step, uh, say, at, at the end or something in an evaluation, run, you, you somehow just compute the low-lying spectrum of your effective ha Hamiltonian, and then you're ready to go and, and do this analysis. So it, it doesn't, there's not a, a large overhead in somehow implant, implementing something new to, to get access to this information. Okay. <clears throat> and so now, um, now I, I would like to, to switch to the, to the next topic. And so, this is, um, so I will briefly talk about finite entanglement uh, scaling. I mean, Luca already gave us an introduction yesterday, and they will point out that even though this works quite well, I think there's still some room for kind of systematic improvement, and we try to, to circumvent or to find a way to, 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 to do that, at least in some simple cases. And um, so this is kind of a one or two slide uh, summary of, of how this finite entanglement scaling works. So, so first of all, we are working again in the infinite system MPS version. So we're not talking about finite system, but infinite system. And then um, since critical system cannot be described by a, a finite bond dimension infinitely accurately, um, there's kind of some effect of that. And it has been uh, observed by Luca and also by Frank and company that um, that kind of there's an empirical or almost Im or semi-empirical relation between the, the induced correlation length in your MPS and the, the bond dimension in your system and with the with the exponent kappa and from some kind of entanglement spectrum scaling arguments by Lefebvre and Calabrese uh, you can you can kind of come up with this uh, exponent kappa which depends only on the central charge and so somehow the yeah, yeah this, this exponent here um, will change if your central charge of the theory uh, changes, but you have a power law relation between the correlation length and the, and the bond dimension you put into your system. And then the, as it's known, no, once you have a finite correlation length, this also regulates or, or cuts off your entanglement entropy, and you have this, um, this entanglement uh, scaling with either the, the correlation length, then it's just c over 6, or if you replace xi, uh, xi with d to the kappa, then you can pull out kappa, and then you get this um, scaling with the log of d. And so this is all beautiful, and I think it's also used a lot by the community to, to actually estimate central charge in the IMPS uh, framework. Um, and in many cases, it's, it's quite okay. But this is a bit of provocative slides where we, I would like to point out that at least if you want to do high precision, that there is some kind of underlying kind of subleading effects in, or discreteness effect of bond dimension, which are not accounted for by this um, kind of a continuous formula. And so depending on how precise you want to be, uh, there, there is some kind of a challenge. And so what 
I think what, what one typically does now is actually plot here um, the entanglement entropy on the vertical scale. And here there are two data sets. So black is I plot um, log D on the horizontal axis. And red is I plot um, kind of as a function of the logarithm of the, the transfer matrix with the correlation length. And so you get these two different lines. And so this is the critical icing model. And so then um, you have these data points. And now we calculate a lot of different bond dimensions. It might be that even we took them one by one up to of the order of 64 or so. Um, and so usually what one does is to actually fit this data to a straight line. And from the slope, you can infer kappa C or, or C itself. Um, but what I want to point out, and that's the provocative part, for example, if you just look at finite differences between the adjacent points, you, you can see, uh, especially for the log, log D part, I mean, the scattering is, is huge. I mean, once you fit over the entire data range, you get reasonably accurate um, results on the order of, say, percent level or so. And that's, of course, OK for many applications. Um, but also the log xi still has kind of noise if you kind of put it to the extreme by looking at adjacent point. And that's, that somehow tells you that this is not yet a, a theory which can be or has been, is able to be systematically refined. And if you want to just somehow now know a central charge to much more precision, I think there's some current limitation um, the way it is done in this finite entanglement scaling, just because we don't understand kind of beyond the leading order formula what, what is like the, the impact of the discrete choice of bond dimension on, on correlation length or, or the entropy. And so what we, uh, sorry, yes? <coughs> sorry, uh, are these uh, orthogonal distances to the line or measured, uh, you know, in the y direction? So say again, what's the question? Like these, these dots, right? They're supposed to be distances to, to... These? Yes. But these are just finite differences, like I infer kind of the, ah. the instantaneous slope. So we don't expect these to be... Just bigger because the slope is bigger? No, the slope is kind of constant, no? No, but the slope of the black is bigger than the slope of the, the red. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's reflected by this fact, no? So, so these, I mean, here there are, there are two, two lines. Uh, one is the exact one, and the one, other one is the slope obtained by the fit over the entire data range. And the same is true here. So I think actually the, the two differences, I mean, they are quite precise as such. But this is just if I do the finite difference between the adjacent point, um, I think this is really amplifying the effect that, that even the, the relative change between points at large bond dimension is actually substantial. That's, I think, what this plot, plot shows. So it's not that somehow these oscillations become smaller at large bond dimension. They actually are still uh, um, are not going away. Wouldn't you expect if it's, like, uh, if it's like Gaussianly distributed in orthogonal distance from the, the straight line, what? and then you... Let's say you just make some But points. I mean, you, you can go forward and come up with a theory what dictates this fluctuation. That would be welcome, but currently there's no such understanding. No. I'm just pointing out this is not, yes, this is not understood. I'm just trying to see whether this, this discrepancy might come from just the difference in slope. Like, if, you, if really the, if the, the distances, orthogonal distance to the line was just the same, but you would make this plot, would you, just because the slope is different, would it look like there's a difference? That's the thing that I'm wondering. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Yes. Spread in it. I know, but I'm yeah. saying like I think if the slope increases, then there would be more spread. So <laughs> is this a standard deviation around the, the curve so or standard This may just be an overly technical point for this the length of this talk, so we, yes. we should go. Uh, on I'm to sorry, the I'm slide, sorry. So. Yes, excuse me. Okay, but I mean, as I said, it's provocative. I'm not, I'm not saying that these methods have, um, have a lot of practical value. I think one should continue to work with them. But I'm just saying I think that there, is, there is something which does not just make them infinitely more precise if you push bond dimension. Usually we think about that. Things just get better. I think these do not necessarily get better with bond dimension. That's my main point. And I think that's uh, cu currently correct, or at least a correct observation in my opinion. Okay, and so now what we do next is, is kind of the, the idea we, we bring in. I mean, the idea itself is not new, but it's perhaps new in this particular context. So um, you see there are different ways to, to kind of um, regulate the CFT or to kind of go away from it. So we, we now know from this prior work that once you have a finite bond dimension, correlation length is, is finite because of that. And then you can analyze the data, um, even though all the details are not understood. But another kind of more obvious way to kind of gap out the CFT is that to actually um, uh, couple to a relevant perturbation. So many CFTs actually have uh, relevant perturbations. And 
of, often in a kind of a context we understand what kind of lattice operate we should we can write down to actually kind of couple to some of these relevant uh, fields. Usually it's dictated by symmetries or so of the problem. Um, but then what, what generically happens, and that's basically the, the field of conformal perturbation theory, is that um, kind of the vicinity of a, of a CFT, once you couple uh, with lambda, is kind of the coupling to a relevant perturbation. And this is just like written kind of in field theory language, so it's a spatial integral of some, some operator. But once we, we, we switch on the non-zero lambda and phi is a relevant field, um, kind of we, we flow to strong coupling, so away from a CFT, but we usually open a gap. And so there's a mass gap and corresponding the finite correlation length. So this is all well, well known. Um, <clears throat> and this is kind of the, the usual RG relation between the correlation length psi, which you now um, kind of um, generate by, by a finite coupling lambda. And kind of the, the power law relation actually has to do with the, with the scaling dimension of the field to which you couple. That's this delta phi, because phi here is the, the perturbation, the relevant field. And so we, we kind of uh, gap out the system and use a finite correlation length. And, um, and therefore, that's also like a result known from uh, Calabrese, uh, sorry, yeah, Calabrese Cardi and, and so on. Is kind of the, this result is that in the vicinity of a CFT, when you gap out, then kind of the, the entanglement entropy is now dictated by the finite correlation length, which here depends on, on the relevant perturbation and not on the bond dimension. And then you have this, this relation. So again, this is not new, but then uh, as, as such. But then what we, what we do, I think, which is not... I'm not aware this has been done before, is now, net, uh, you see, we, we take this relation, kind of it's obvious, but now we, we invert it. So we basically mean that we, we express the correlation length via this formula, basically as the exponential of some difference in entanglement entropy, and then there's also this factor C over six um, appearing. And, um, and so what we're now su suggesting is that we kind of, we perturb away from a CFT, um, so there's this coupling lambda, which dictates which value we, we choose. But then we actually want to analyze things now not as a function of correlation length, but actually as a function of, of entropy. And so that has a little bit of a flavor of, say, entanglement renormalization, which also people have been advocating. It's not exactly that, but I think there's a flavor to it. And, um, and so if you, you see, usually you have a relation, say that um, the induced expectation value of the field phi uh, scales as a power law, like as delta phi uh, with lambda, but since now, or uh, as a correlation length, but since we replace the correlation length with, um, with the, this expression, so basically uh, the, the the exponent enters here as a, as a prefactor in front of the entropy. And then you can also kind of um, ha have this relation between lambda and the entropy. And then you see this RG exponent uh, pops up again. And also another thing we, we like is actually the excess energy. Um, you could argue that at the CFT, you have like your reference of the energy. And then if you perturb your wave function away from the CFT and you ask what it is, is its variational energy still at the CFT, then because of the variational principle, it has to be positive. And so the excess energy is actually also controlled by the, by the correlation length. And since the energy, uh, as Guifre said, is that it's related to the stress energy tensor with the scaling dimension two for these CFTs. And so here, the, the, the scaling dimension is not known, but it's two. And that's why there is now this 12 over C. So these are kind of simple relations. And if you make them a bit more, more precise, so in the end, what is the point is that we, we do simulations for different values of lambda. We can then measure um, kind of excess energies or, or also local magnetizations or here is deviations of magnetizations. And the idea is that now that if we take the log of these measurements and we take the numerical derivative with respect to entropy, we actually get simple expressions. For example, if we do excess energy, take the log of it, take the derivative with respect to the entropy, we get the 12 over C. And so the idea is by, by basically calculating numerical derivatives with respect to the entropy, we, we get the proxy or a, an estimate for, for the central charge. Um, and here we get, an, once we know then the estimate for the central charge, we can get estimate for the scaling dimension and, and so on. And so that's kind of the program. What we do, we, we turn away, we do a simul, uh, run with different values of lambda, and then we take derivatives with respect to the entropy, which we also measure, and then we get these, these estimates. So let's see how that, how that works. Um, and so, as always, we start off with, uh, with the Ising model. So this is the Hamiltonian. And we, we have two kind of uh, different perturbations which are relevant. This is well known from the structure of the phase diagram of an Ising model. That is like a thermal axis in the absence of field. That's um, kind of, and that's um, basically the thermal coupling, the epsilon field with scaling dimension one. So that's 
responsible, for example, for the exponent nu. Um, and then um, there's also the, the coupling to the, to the order parameter, to the sigma field, and that has a scaling dimension 1 over 8. So if you couple to the local C magnetization, this Hamiltonian convention, that's actually coupling to sigma. And if you do if you um, detune the transverse field from its critical value, then we're basically coupling to the epsilon field. So now I show a result for the first case where we couple to the, to the longitudinal field. <clears throat> and so now what I'm showing is that, so it's Ising model, we're detuning with the longitudinal magnetic field. And these different points are different values of lambda, of this perturbation. And we, we lose like a logarithmic grid, which means like we reduce the value of lambda by a factor two from one point to the next. And so here, lambda is very large. Basically, our spins are all, all pointing up because that's what the effect of the longitudinal field. And then we, we reduce lambda more and more. And so this is just bond dimension four, so it's ridiculously small. And here on the axis, I plot the entropy of the optimized MPS bond dimension four for different values of lambda. And what I plot here is now this running exponent, uh, sorry, this running central charge obtained by basically the log derivative of the excess energy as a, um, with respect to the entropy. So that's the curve just for bond dimension four. And then to see what the bond dimension does is that we, if we increase bond dimension chi to, sorry, to, to eight, um, it lies on top for large values of lambda, then it continues a bit further. And so if you do that to larger and larger values, so here on this plot, we have bond dimension up to 256. And um, so you, we, we get visually close to one half as we, as we expect. And so then you can do a more, a more uh, quantitative analysis. Um, so again, here, this is the same uh, thing, but now we subtract one half, that's the expected central charge. And this plot basically shows you if you put, uh, push the bond dimension quite hard, um, 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 uh, quite a lot, then using this running derivative, we can actually get a, a running estimate of the central charge of the Ising model, which is accurate to, to 10 to the minus four. So quite a bit larger than the percent level we had, we had before in the standard entanglement, finite entanglement scaling, yes? No. I don't think so, but okay. <clears throat> yeah. And so, so this is the the central charge. But then we can also do, um, for example, get the corresponding estimate for the scaling dimension of the sigma field, um, one over eight. Um, which is expected, and here, here you can also see it's getting very accurate, and I think here we are approaching something like 10 to the minus eight. So that's also extremely um, accurate. And, um, and the, another thing is that also we can get, using the same perturbation scheme, so still with the longitudinal field, we can also actually also get access to the, the scaling dimension of the thermal field, and that's the reason it has to do with the non-vanishing OPE coefficient, which means that if you, if you perturb the Ising model with the longitudinal field, uh, kind of it automatically induces also a change kind of in the thermal field. And so we can basically measure what is kind of the sigma x. How does the sigma x expectation value change with respect to the value at criticality? And that, that, that change is also governed by a, by a power law and it's basically controlled by the scaling dimensions of the, of the thermal field. So we know that one is one. So we can also check, and so here, see the 10 to the minus one, three, so this is about 10 to the minus four, I would say. And so we have, we're getting on the order of 10 to the minus four um, for this. So here this is just kind of, a, I mean, it's an accurate um, proof of principle or demonstration that this works. One has to say that if one looks at um, um, MERA results or also these PUMPS results for, for MPS uh, spectral methods on, on finite rings, I think these precisions are probably comparable in some cases, perhaps more accurate or less accurate we, we can discuss, but it, it's, not, it's not setting entirely new records, but at least within IMPS, I think this is a quite nice application where kind of actually regulating the, the CFT with a relevant perturbation and then analyze as a function of this, uh, the, the coupling gives quite nice results. And I think it's, it's more, conver I mean, it's a, it leads to higher precision than the standard scaling with finite bond dimension, I would, I would say, at least for these cases here. Yes? Have you thought about using automatic differentiation to take the derivatives? No, we haven't. No, I think we started. We're already working a bit uh, long on this project, but I think when we started, that was not on the market, at least not in the tensor networks. But, but it, you're right. That's perhaps something we should also think about, or, or in a in a kind of one, one. If someone is interested to put this into production, there are probably improvements like what you suggest to use AD to 
to push that, yeah? Because it's, it's true, I didn't mention it, but, but of course these are done using kind of a more or less naive finite difference formulas in entropy. So there's also a discretization error, which I don't, um, but, but I mean, it's not so dramatic because these derivatives anyway go down. So I think usually it's just like a, a prefact. It's not somehow changing the orders of magnitude of the correction, but it's something which one should take into account as well. <clears throat> okay. Um, and this is um, kind of just a, a, a non-trivial ap application. So this is again a kind of Heisenberg spin chain. So this Haldane conjecture, which popped up in the first part um, as well. And so you see Haldane conjecture basically maps um, the, the physics of these um, um, spin chains. So it's Heisenberg spin chains with various values of s. And as I told you, for half integer s, you would expect that in the infrared, so at long distance, um, your, um, your chain goes to a c equals 1 CFT, uh, whereas the, the integer spins actually go gapped. That's, that's, a, that's, that's kind of the answer what happens in infrared, but actually in the UV, or as, as the at intermediate scales, actually the, the theory of the nonlinear sigma model would actually say that this system almost looks like two massless fields, so it actually has an effective central charge of two at intermediate scales. And only in the infrared, you either go to C equals one, because you go to this westomino witten theory, or you go gapped, and then the central charge is kind of zero. And what, what I like is that here, kind of this is, this is all visible in this plot. So what we do is, again, we calculate the running central charge by, by the same means, and um, we look at different spin chains. And now what we're doing is that the, the Heisenberg spin chain are actually one of the very relevant perturbation is to apply a staggered magnetic field because they, they want to be almost antiferromagnetic. So if you actually have a, a staggered magnetic field, it gaps out immediately. Um, and so that's basically the perturbation we do. Again, these different points are different values of the, of the perturbation. Um, and so now what is nice is that if we do that for spin one half, um, it's what, what you expect. It starts at zero, it overshoots slightly, but then it approaches C equals one as it should because the Heisenberg spin a half chain is known to be half C equals a half. And then if you do spin one, um, it, it rises the same thing, it overshoots, and then at some point it breaks down because spin one chain is capped, as we all know. Um, but then we, we can continue this game. So spin three half, actually it, it rises from zero, then it hovers somewhat, um, e, uh, somewhat uh, above two, and then it slowly drifts and crosses over to C equals one. So I think that's a, a quite nice illustration that somehow at, in the UV or at intermediate scales, you're almost at two, and then you, you somehow there's a crossover flow to C equals one. Um, and then you, you do spin two, so spin two also joins, I mean, does the same as spin three half for a while, and then it also overshoots and it breaks down because again, it has a gap. Um, and then the other ones which we can reach, so spin five half and spin three, they actually uh, follow the, this uh, thick dat dashed line, which is actually the, uh, the spin wave theory. And that one goes indeed to this C equals two because it's effectively two massless bosons. Um, and so that's kind of the intermediate scale prediction and that's kind of this, um, I think you see this equals two is also, you can call it asymptotic freedom in the nonlinear sigma model. And so that's something you can actually see through, through this analysis. And I think that's also a nice way to, to see these concepts at work. Like at intermediate scales, you, if you crank up S, the intermediate scale has C equals two. And then the infrared, you either flow down to one or you, you go to, to a gap and C goes to zero. So you see this kind of Haldane conjecture at work and the kind of some result from the nonlinear sigma model pop up here. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm done with my time. I had a few questions. I would just like to advertise that some of these uh, uh, rel uh, questions with relevant uh, perturbation, we, we actually have a preprint out where we use that already to diagnose weekly um, first order phase transitions. I don't have time to explain that, but one of the results is, for example, that if you do this technology and applying, not using tensor network, but using QMC, we actually think that the JQ model on the square lattice is, is actually uh, weekly first order and not the, not the deconfined uh, critical point. And then I jump this 2D part. You can ask me in the break or read the paper if you want. Um, and so, sorry. Um, then would like to acknowledge the collaborator. Alexander Eberhardt was involved in both as the PhD student. He did most of the numerical work in those projects I presented. Michael Rader was the student who did the work on the IPEPs, which I couldn't tell you. And then Lawrence, who is also here, and Frank Verstrate, who I guess you all know, they, they were involved in the Speed of Light project I, I showed you in the beginning. And with this, I conclude with some plots and I stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Okay.
Okay, let's just take like one question. So, does someone have a question after Andreas's talk? We already had a few during the talk. Yes. Why the entanglement scaling doesn't necessarily improve with one dimension, but when you scale it with the entanglement entropy, the error is controlled. Like, yeah, I mean the. The two things are different is that the, the source of regulating making entanglement entropy finite is not the same in the two schemes. One, it's really like a relevant perturbation, and then on kind of on more conventional physical grounds, you expect the correlation length to be finite, and then you can work with the bond dimension, which is large enough so that, that, that it's not, the bond truncation effects do not show up. I think the main reason is that we, we, we have like a leading order or, or um, understanding of what is the impact of, of a finite bond dimension on an infinite MPS, but we don't have a, a theory which can be systematically refined. So I think it's correct. It's like a good, a good uh, effective theory, but it, it, we don't know what, what additional terms or corrections we have to take into account to make that uh, uh, theory or that description more accurate. I think we're lacking the next step or the next orders in whatever that expansion might be. Thank you.